Keep Out by Frederick Brown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Halliday. Keep Out by Frederick Brown. With no more room left on Earth, and with Mars hanging up there empty of life, somebody hit on the plan of starting a colony on the Red Planet. It meant changing the habits and physical structure of the immigrants, but that worked out fine. In fact, every possible factor was covered, except one of the flaws of human nature. Daptine is the secret of it. Adaptine, they called it at first. Then it got shortened to daptine. It let us adapt. They explained it all to us when we were ten years old. I guess they thought we were too young to understand before then, Although we knew a lot of it already, they told us just after we landed on Mars. You are home, children, the head teacher told us after we had gone into the glassite dome they'd built for us there. And he told us there'd be a special lecture for us that evening, an important one that we must all attend. And that evening he told us the whole story, and the whys and wherefores. He stood up before us. He had to wear a heated spacesuit and helmet. Of course, because the temperature in the dome was comfortable for us, but already freezing cold for him, and the air was already too thin for him to breathe. His voice came to us by radio from inside his helmet. Children, he said, you are home. This is Mars, the planet on which you will spend the rest of your lives. You are Martians, the first Martians. You have lived five years on Earth and another five in space. Now you'll spend ten years until you are adults in this dome. Although toward the end of that time, you will be allowed to spend increasingly long periods outdoors. Then you will go forth and make your own homes, live your own lives as Martians. You will intermarry, and your children will breed true. They too will be Martians. It's time you were told the history of this great experiment of which each of you is part. Then he told us. Man, he said had first reached Mars in 1985. It had been uninhabited by intelligent life. There is plenty of plant life and a few varieties of non-flying insects. And he had found it by terrestrial standards uninhabitable. Man could survive on Mars only by living inside glassite domes and wearing spacesuits when he went outside of them. Except by day, in the warmer seasons, it was too cold for him. The air was too thin for him to breathe, and long exposure to sunlight, less filtered of rays harmful to him than on Earth because of the lesser atmosphere, could kill him. The plants were chemically alien to him, and he could not eat them. He had to bring all his food from Earth or grow it in hydroponic tanks. For 50 years he had tried to colonize Mars, and all his efforts had failed. Besides this dome, which had been built for us, there was only one other outpost, another glassite dome much smaller and less than a mile away. It had looked as though mankind could never spread to the other planets of the solar system besides Earth, for of all of them, Mars was the least inhospitable. If he couldn't live here, there was no use even trying to colonize the others. And then, in 2034, 30 years ago, a brilliant biochemist named Weymoth had discovered daptine, a miracle drug that worked not on the animal or person to whom it was given, but on the progeny he conceived during a limited period of time after inoculation. It gave his progeny almost limitless adaptability to changing conditions, provided the changes were made gradually. Dr. Weymoth had inoculated and then mated a pair of guinea pigs. They had borne a litter of five, and by placing each member of the litter under different and gradually changing conditions, he had obtained amazing results. When they attained maturity, one of these guinea pigs was living comfortably at a temperature of 40 below zero Fahrenheit. Another was quite happy at 150 above. A third was thriving on a diet that would have been deadly poison for an ordinary animal. And a fourth was contented under a constant X-ray bombardment that would have killed one of its parents within minutes. Subsequent experiments with many litters showed that animals who had been adapted to similar conditions bred true, and their progeny was conditioned from birth to live under those conditions. Ten years later, ten years ago, the head teacher told us, you children were born. 
born of parents carefully selected from those who volunteered for the experiment. And from birth, you have been brought under carefully controlled and gradually changing conditions. From the time you were born, the air you have breathed has been very gradually thinned and its oxygen content reduced. Your lungs have compensated by becoming much greater in capacity, which is why your chests are so much larger than those of your teachers and attendants. When you are fully mature and are breathing air like that of Mars, the difference will be even greater. Your bodies are growing fur to enable you to stand the increasing cold. You are comfortable now under conditions which would kill ordinary people quickly. Since you were four years old, your nurses and teachers have had to wear special protection to survive conditions that seem normal to you. In another 10 years, at maturity, you will be completely acclimated to Mars. Its air will be your air, its food plants your food, its extremes of temperature will be easy for you to endure, and its median temperature is pleasant to you. Already, because of the five years we spent in space under gradually decreasing gravitational pull, the gravity of Mars seems normal to you. It will be your planet to live on and to populate. You are the children of Earth, but you are the first Martians. Of course, we had known a lot of those things already. The last year was the best. By then, the air inside the dome, except for the pressurized parts where our teachers and attendants lived, was almost like that outside, and we were allowed out for increasingly long periods. It is good to be in the open. The last few months, they relaxed segregation of the sexes so we could begin choosing mates. Although they told us there was to be no marriage until after the final day, after our full clearance, choosing was not difficult in my case. I had made my choice long since, and I'd felt sure that she felt the same way. I was right. Tomorrow is the day of our freedom. Tomorrow we will be Martians. The Martians. Tomorrow we shall take over the planet. Some among us are impatient, have been impatient for weeks now, but wiser counsel prevailed and we are waiting. We have waited 20 years and we can wait until the final day. And tomorrow is the final day. Tomorrow, at a signal, we will kill the teachers and the other earthmen among us before we go forth. They do not suspect, so it will be easy. We have dissimulated for years now, and they do not know how we hate them. They do not know how disgusting and hideous we find them, with their ugly, misshapen bodies, so narrow-shouldered and tiny-chested, their weak, sibilant voices that need amplification to carry in our Martian air, and above all, their white, pasty, hairless skins. We shall kill them, and then we shall go and smash the other dome so all the Earthmen there will die too. If more Earthmen ever come to punish us, we can live and hide in the hills where they will never find us. And if they try to build more domes here, we'll smash them. We want no more to do with Earth. This is our planet, and we want no aliens. Keep off. End of Keep Out by Frederick Brown Let There Be Light by Horace B. Fife this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Let There Be Light by Horace B. Fife. No matter what the future, one factor must always be reckoned with. The ingenuity of the human animal. The two men attacked the thick tree trunk with a weary savagery. In the bright sunlight, glistening spatters of sweat flew from them as the old axes bit alternately into the wood. Blackie stood nearby on the gravel shoulder of the highway, rubbing his short beard as he considered the depth of the white notch. Turning his broad tanned face to glance along the patched and cracked concrete to where squat Vito kept watch, he caught the latter's eye and beckoned. Okay, Sid, Mike, we'll take it a while. The rhythm of the axe strokes ceased. Red Mike swept the back of a forearm across the semi-shaven stubble that set him as something of a dandy. Wordlessly, Big Sid ambled up the road to replace Vito. "'Pretty soon now,' boasted Mike, eyeing the cut with satisfaction. "'Think it'll bring them?' "'Sure,' replied Blackie, spitting on his hands and lifting one of the worn tools. "'That's what they're for.' "'Funny,' mused Mike. "'How some keep going and others bust. These must have been working since I was a little kid.' 
since before the last blitz. Oh, they don't have to do much, except in the winter when they come out to clear the snow. All they do is put in a patch now and then. Mike stared moodily at the weathered surface of the highway and edged back to avoid the reflected heat. It beats me how they know a spot has cracked. I guess there's machines to run the machines, sighed Blackie. I don't know. I was too young. Okay, Vito? The relieving pair fell, too. Mike stepped out of the range of the flying chips to sit at the edge of the soft grass, which was attempting another invasion of the gravel shoulder. Propelled by the strength of Vito's powerful torso, a single chip spun through the air to his feet. He picked it up and held it to his nose. It had a good, clean smell. When at length the tree crashed down across the road, Blackie led them to the ambush he had chosen that morning. It was fifty yards up the road, toward the ruined city, off to the side, where a clump of trees and bushes provided shade and concealment. "'Wish we brought something to eat,' Vito said. "'Didn't know it would take so long to creep up on him this morning,' said Blackie. "'The women'll have something when we get back.' They better, said Mike. He measured a slender branch with his eye. After a moment, he pulled out a hunting knife, worn thin by years of sharpening, and cut off a straight section of the branch. He began whittling. You damn fool, Sid objected. You want the busted spot on the tree to show? Ah, oh, they ain't got the brains to notice. The hell they ain't. It stands out like one of them old street signs. Do you think they can tell, Blackie? I don't know. Maybe. Blackie rose cautiously to peer over a bed of blackberry bushes. Guess I'll skin up a tree and see if anything's in sight. He hitched up his pants, looking for an easy place to climb. His blue jeans had been stoutly made, but weakened by many rips and patches, and he did not want to rip them on a snag. It was becoming difficult to find good, unrotted clothing in the old ruins. Choosing a branch slightly over his head, he sprang for it, pulled, kicked against the trunk, and flowed up into the foliage with no apparent effort. The others waited below. Sid glanced up occasionally. Vito idly kicked at one of the clubs made from an old two-by-four. The other lay beneath the piled jackets, but enough of the end protruded to show that they had been chopped from the same timber— Gray painted on one side, stained and gouged on the other, where boards had once been nailed. A coil of rope lay beside the axis. High in the upper branches, Blackie braced himself with negligent confidence and stared along the concrete ribbon. From here, he thought, you'd almost think the place was still alive, instead of crumbling around our ears. The windows of the distant houses were dark, unglassed holes, but the sunlight made the masonry clean and shining. To Blackie, the ragged tops of most of the buildings were as natural as the tattered look of the few people he knew. Beyond, toward the center of the city, was real evidence of his race's bygone might, a vast jumble of shattered stone and fused metal. Queer weeds and mosses infected the area, but it would be centuries before they could mask the desolation. Better covered were the heaps along the road, seemingly shoved just beyond the gravel shoulders, moldering mounds which legend said were once machines to ride in along the pavement. Something glinted at the bend of the highway. Blackie peered closer. He swarmed down the tree from branch to branch, so lithely that the trio below hardly had the warning of the vibrating leaves before he dropped cat-footed among them. They're coming! He shrugged quickly into his stained jacket, emulated in silent haste by the others. Vito rubbed his hands down the hairy chest, left revealed by his open jacket, and hefted one of the clubs. In his broad paws it seemed light. They were quiet, watching Sid peer out through the narrowly parted brush of the undergrowth. Blackie fidgeted behind him. Finally he reached out as if to pull the other aside, but at that moment Sid released the bushes and crouched. The others, catching his warning glance, fell prone, peering through the shrubbery and around tree trunks with savage eyes. The distant squawk of a jay became suddenly very clear, as did the sighing of a faint breeze through the leaves overhead. Then a new, clanking, humming sound intruded. A procession of three vehicles rolled along the highway at an unvarying pace which took no account of patches or worn spots. 
they jounced in turn across a patch laid over a previous unsuccessful patch and halted before the felled tree. Two were bulldozers, the third was a light truck with compartments for tools. No human figures were visible. A moment later the working force appeared, a column of eight robots. These deployed as they reached the obstacle and explored like colossal ants along its length. "'What are they after?' asked Mike, whispering, although he lay fifty yards away. "'They're looking over the job for whatever sends them out,' Blackie whispered back. "'See those little lights sticking out the tops of their heads? "'I heard tell once that's how they run.' Some of the robots took saws from the truck and began to cut through the tree trunk. Others produced cables and huge hooks to attach the obstacle to the bulldozers. "'Look at them go!' sighed Sid, hunching his stiff shoulders jealously. Took us hours, and they're half done already. They watched as the robots precisely severed the part of the tree that blocked the highway, going not one inch beyond the gravel shoulder, and helped the bulldozers to tug it aside. On the opposite side of the concrete, the shoulder tapered off into a six-foot drop. The log was jockeyed around parallel to this ditch and rolled into it, amid a thrashing of branches and a spurting of small pebbles. Glad we're on the high side, whispered Mike. That thing would squash a guy's guts right out. Keep listening to me, Blackie said, and you'll keep on being in the right place at the right time. Mike raised his eyebrows at Vito, who thrust out his lower lip and nodded sagely. Sid grinned, but no one contradicted the boast. They're lining up, Blackie warned tensely. You guys ready? Where's that rope? Someone thrust it into his hands. Still squinting at the scene on the highway, he fumbled for the ends and held one out to Mike. The others gripped their clubs. "'Now remember,' ordered Blackie. "'Me and Mike will trip up the last one in the line. You two get in there quick and wallop him over the head, but good.' "'Don't go away while we're doing it,' said Big Sid. "'They won't chase you, but they look out for themselves. I don't want to get tossed twenty feet again.' The eyes of the others flicked toward the jagged white scar running down behind Sid's right ear and under the collar of his jacket. Then they swung back to the road. Good, breathed Blackie. The rolling stuff's going first. The truck and bulldozers set out towards the city, with the column of robots marching a fair distance behind. The latter approached the ambush, drew abreast, began to pass. Blackie raised himself to a crouch, with just the tips of his fingers steadying him. As the last robot plodded by, he surged out of the brush, joined to Red Mike by their grips on the twenty feet of rope. They ran up behind the marching machine, trailed by the others. In his right hand, Blackie twirled the part of the rope hanging between him and Mike. On the second swing, he got it over the head of the robot. He saw Mike brace himself. The robot staggered. It pivoted clumsily to its left, groping vaguely for the hindrance. Mike and Blackie tugged again, and the machine wound up facing them in its efforts to maintain balance. Its companions marched steadily along the road. "'Switch ends!' barked Blackie. Alert, Mike tossed him the other end of the rope and caught Blackie's. They ran past the robot, on either side, looping it in. Blackie kept going until he was above the ditch— he wound a turn of rope around his forearm and plunged down the bank. A shower of gravel spattered after him as Mike jammed his heels into the shoulder of the highway to anchor the other end. Then he heard the booming sound of the robot's fall. Blackie clawed his way up the bank. Vito and Sid were smashing furiously at the floundering machine. Mike danced about the melee with bared teeth, charging in once as if to leap upon the quarry with both feet, frustrated by the peril of the whirling two-by-fours. He swept up handfuls of gravel to hurl. Blackie turned to run for one of the axes. Just then, Sid struck home to the head of the robot. Sparks spat out amid a tinkle of glass. The machine ceased all motion. "'All right!' panted Blackie. "'All right, that's enough!' They stepped back, snarls fading. A handful of gravel trickled through Mike's fingers and pattered loudly on the concrete. Gradually the men began to straighten up, seeing the robot as an inert heap of metal rather than as a weird beast in its death throes. "'We better load up and get,' said Blackie. "'We want to be over on the trail if they send something up the road to look for us.' Vito dragged the robot off the highway by the head, and they began the task of lashing it to the two-by-fours. 
It was about two hours later when they plodded around a street corner among the ruins and stopped before a fairly intact building. By that time they had picked up an escort of dirty, half-clad children who ran ahead to spread the news. Two other men and a handful of women gathered around with eager exclamations. The hunters dropped their catch. "'Better get to work on him,' said Blackie, glancing at the sky. "'Be dark soon.' The men who had remained as guards ran inside the entrance of the polished granite and brought out tools, hammers, crowbars, hatchets. Behind them hurried women with basins and large cans. The original four, wary from the weight of the robot despite frequent pauses on the trail, stepped back. "'Where first, Blackie?' asked one of the men, waiting for the women to untangle the rope and timbers. "'Try all the joints. After that, we'll crack them open down the middle for the main supply tank.' He watched the metal give way under the blows. As the robot was dismembered, the fluid that had lubricated the complex mechanism flowed from its wounds and was poured by the women into a five-gallon can. "'Bring a cupful, Judy,' Blackie told his woman, a wiry blonde girl. "'I want to see if it's as good as the last.' He lit a stick at the fire as they crossed the littered once ornate lobby, and she followed him down a dim hall. He pulled aside the skins that covered their doorway, then stumbled his way to the table. The window was still uncovered against the night chill, but it looked out on a courtyard shadowed by towering walls. To eyes adjusted to the sunny street, the room was dark. Judy poured the oil into the makeshift lamp, waited for the rag wick to soak, and held it out to Blackie. He lit the wick from his stick. "'It burns real good, Blackie.' the girl said, wrinkling her nose against the first oily smoke. Gee, you're smart to catch one the first day out. Tell them other dames to watch how they use it, he warned. This ought to last a month or more when we get them all emptied. He blew out the dying flame on the stick and dropped the charred wood thoughtfully to the floor. No, nah, I ain't so smart, he admitted. Or I'd figure a way to make one of them work the garden for us. Maybe some day. But this kind won't do nothing but fix that goddamn road. And what good's that to anybody? His woman moved the burning lamp carefully to the center of the table. Anyway, it's going to be better than last winter, she said. We'll have lights now. End of Let There Be Light by Horace B. Fife. The Long Way Back by John Barrett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Long Way Back by John Barrett. Read by Quartertone. Brainerd died on the third day after they set out from the wreck. Carl Reese and the girl, Taylor Brill, scraped a grave in the sand with flat pieces of rock and laid him in it on the litter they had used to carry him. They covered it with rocks to keep the sand wolves out and set off again across the desert. That day they did not go far. The sun came down through the cloudless Martian sky like a hammer. Every hour or so they had to creep into the shadow of the rocks and rest. It was about mid-afternoon when the girl collapsed. Carl carried her to one of the shallow caves in the cliffs that were growing more numerous and gave her the water flask to sip. Her blonde hair was grayed with powdery sand, and Carl saw there were hollows now under her reddened eyes, but even with the strain of fatigue, her clean-featured face was beautiful. He watched her slender throat as she sipped the water. He thought, she can't stand much more of this, she's not built for it. The flask was still heavy when she handed it back. "'You'll need more than that to keep you going till sundown,' he said. She shook her head. "'You better go on alone. It's getting so I can't see very well.' Carl Reese looked out at the crumbling rock and sand. "'It was not the heat that got you. The middle of this desert was no warmer than a cool day back on Earth, but the sun, pounding down through the thin air, dehydrated you and did funny things to your brain.' and if you stood up under that, the glittering sand drove you blind. "'We might as well stay here for the night,' he said. "'It's as good a place as any.' "'How much water is there left?' she asked. "'There's a quart in the other flask,' he said. 
He knew there was hardly a pint, but if he had said so, she wouldn't take any more. She leaned back against the rock and squinted at the shimmering wasteland. Do you think Brainerd really saw a ship? she asked. Of course he did. Brainerd wouldn't lie about a thing like that. How could he see a ship on the ground when we were falling at six hundred miles an hour? He could see the sun flash on the metal, Carl said. She pushed the grayed curls back from her cheek. But if there was a ship, we should have found it by now. Not necessarily, Carl said. We haven't been traveling very fast. The girl looked at her hand that was covered with gray dust from her hair. I'm a mess, she said. You ought to try and sleep a little, Carl said. You were taking care of Brainerd all last night. No, I'm not sleepy. Carl sat there watching her. In a few minutes, he saw her eyes close and her head droop forward on her knees. She did not wake up when he laid her down at the back of the cave and shoved his jacket under her head. When the sun sank and the chill began to make him shiver, Carl went outside to look for fuel. As usual, there were no plants, not even a blade of dried grass, but in the face of a nearby cliff he found again a ledge of coal. At least, he thought, the desert furnishes us one thing, and it keeps us from turning to ice in the night. He carried back an armful and followed the procedure of the night before, breaking the lumps into little pieces and grinding a few of them into a black powder that would burst into flame with a second shot from the heat gun. When the fire was going, he gathered enough coal to last through the night and sat down to doze away the hours. Nights were the worst. In the daytime, there was always the next patch of shade to be reached or you had the compass to check. Even the job of putting one foot ahead of the other was something to concentrate on. At night, with only the flames of the fire and the moan of the wind in the rocks, your mind wandered, and once more you were streaking through space in an interplanetary patrol ship with home port on Earth only twenty hours away. You were in the pilot's seat pointing out interesting landmarks on the planet Mars to the pretty blonde girl from Cabin 3 who was standing beside you and you were wishing that her smile and good humor meant something personal, knowing all the time that it was only because she and you and the five men in the main cabin had uncovered information that was going to stop a threatened invasion of Earth by the little men of Jupiter. And then the dream suddenly turned horrible as the ship was caught in an invisible net that jammed the controls under your hands and hurled you down upon the face of the red planet. Carl woke up sweating, his fists clenched, his arms aching from the fight with a phantom rudder lever. The flames had dwindled to red coals. He saw the girl was shivering in her sleep. He built up the fire and lifted her closer. She opened her eyes. I was dreaming I was still working in the consular office, she said vaguely, and the director told me to put a note on the bulletin board informing the employees that we were about to enter the 143rd Ice Age. The sun will be up in an hour, he said. They sat watching the rocks and the cliffs take shape in the half-light of dawn. Sometimes I wish you weren't such a good pilot, she said wearily. What do you mean? I mean the way you pulled the ship out of that dive so that only four people were killed instead of seven. Carl stared into the fire. If we don't find something today, he thought, she'll crack up. He handed the water flask to her. She shook her head. Take some, he said sternly. You've only had a couple of swallows since yesterday noon. How much have you had? she asked. I've had my share, he said. I feel pretty good. You're a liar, she said evenly. You haven't had any. Carl swore to himself. What could you do? You couldn't hit her over the head and force it down her throat when she was unconscious. Outside, the rocks changed from deep rose to light pink and then to glaring yellow. Already, the sand was beginning to sparkle. If we do find that ship, what good will it do? She asked. It'll be a wreck like ours was, only worse. Brainerd said he thought it wasn't wrecked. She covered her eyes from the glare of the sand. To me, that doesn't make sense, she said. Those fiends from Jupiter aren't stupid. They'd know that if they let anyone get through their electronic beam net from either side, the cat would be out of the bag. 
but the last news report we received before we hit the net had an item in it announcing Dekmar had just landed on Mars with his new experimental ship. Dekmar has a reputation as a crackpot. Maybe he was transmitting from space somewhere near Earth. With him, it might have been some sort of a publicity stunt. I think you've got the wrong idea about Dekmar, Carl said. He's a crackpot in some ways. Lots of bright people are, but he's sincere. If he said he was broadcasting from the Lucerian Desert on Mars, that's where he was. Then why didn't he say something about the net? They said his broadcast was cut off right after it started. If he was smart enough to get a ship through the net, why couldn't he get a visa phone signal through it? Carl felt the anger swell up in his throat. He stood up. All right, then. Have it your way. It was all a hoax, and Brainerd didn't see a ship, and maybe we're going to fry out here in this desert. What of it? Is it a crime to be an optimist? Just because... He stopped. She was sobbing. I'm sorry, he said gently. He thought, it's beginning to get to me too. She stood up slowly and brushed the sand from her clothes. No, you're right, she said. I don't know why I talk like that. I guess I just want you to argue against me. When you tell me I'm wrong, it makes me feel better. Carl rubbed his prickly chin. She was sure a hard one to figure out. We better get moving, he said, before it gets too bright. He started to give her the water flask, and then saw she was going to balk again. He took two swallows himself and handed it to her. She took two swallows also. They made good time for the first two hours. After that, the sun was torture. By mid-morning, they were forced into the shade again. Carl felt his leg muscles begin to quiver as he eased himself back against the rocks. He looked at the girl and saw that her face was white. You lie down for a while, he said. I'm going to climb this rock pile and look around. He got up. I'll go with you, she said. Just let me rest a few minutes. You're too tired, Carl said. I'll be all right in a few minutes. They rested for a half hour, and then the girl followed him up through the jagged boulders. He kept looking back, waiting for her to say she had had enough. She followed him silently. Her fingertips were bleeding, and there was a long red scrape on her calf. It took twenty minutes to reach the flat top. Carl stood up shakily and looked around. The desert stretched for miles, a waste of rock and sand, shimmering under the wavering air. He looked west and saw that their way would soon be blocked by deep, sheer canyons. He faced the southwest, and something bright made him blink. He opened his eyes wide. On a low mesa-like outcropping near the edge of one of the canyons lay a rocket ship. The metal was smooth and unscarred. It rested there as if it had been landed gently. I can see it, he told the girl. It's about three miles away. He leaned down and helped her up beside him. Fire your gun at a rock, the girl said. If there's anyone aboard, he'll hear the explosion. Carl took out his heat pistol and aimed at a large flat rock near the base of the pile. A long blue flame speared out. Carl kept his finger on the trigger, and the rock suddenly exploded with an ear-shattering crack. They looked toward the ship. There was no sign of a response. The walk across the last stretch of sand seemed endless. There was no chance to stop or rest. The sun drove them on. Carl thought, if there's no water aboard her, we're finished. Fifty feet from the big hull, he stopped. Deckmar, he called out. The metal rang to his voice. In the canyon beyond, he heard a tiny rock slide rattle into nothingness. Maybe it's not Deckmar's ship, the girl said. Maybe it's been here for years. It's Deckmar's ship, all right, Carl said. I can tell by those ridges running down the side of the hull. I happened to be at the factory one day last spring when he was having them put on. They walked around behind the tailpipes and found the hatch in the other side. It was partly open. Carl started toward it, but the girl grabbed his arm. What's that? She was pointing to a wide trailing furrow in the sand by the hatch. Carl felt a prickling sensation along his spine. I don't know he said. It looks like the track of some animal. He swung open the door. 
Whatever it is, we've got to get in out of this sun. He stepped over the high threshold. The inside of the ship, protected by the heavy insulation in the hull, was cold. Carl blinked into the darkness and yelled out, Deckmar! There was no answer. He began rolling back some of the shutters covering the ports. The girl came up beside him. There's a light in one of the forward cabins. Carl looked down the alleyway and saw a small light burning over a desk. They walked cautiously toward it and came out into the control room near the nose of the ship. The light threw long shadows over a big panel of levers and dials. In one corner of the panel, three meters were glowing red. His visophone set is still on, Carl said. He must have been interrupted while he was broadcasting. He stepped toward the panel and almost fell over a chair lying on the floor. He picked it up and saw the back of it was splintered. He glanced quickly around the cabin. On a table by the control panel was a small metal box. The lever on the side of it was almost twisted off. Then he saw the door hanging crazily by one hinge. It looks like there's been a fight, he said. He found a switch and turned on the lights and heat all over the ship. Walking back along the alleyway, he saw that the bulkheads had long scratches in them and two flush lights overhead had been smashed. He reached the hatch and stepped down to follow the trail in the sand. It led to the cliff edge. He was bending down, trying to make sense of the furrow when he heard the girl scream. Looking up, he saw her standing in the hatchway. She was staring wildly behind him. He did not wait to look around. He ran to the ship, jumped inside, and yanked the door too. At the same instant, something hissed through the air and whammed down across the hull. Carl bolted the hatch. What is it? A snake. The girl's voice was faint. Carl looked out the port and his stomach seemed to turn over. The snake had a body as thick as a big tree and a wide plow-shaped head. It thrashed at the hull. Carl winced as its teeth scraped across the metal surface. Well, we know what happened to Dekmar, he said. He must have left the hatch open while he was using the visa phone and the thing got him. The girl was swaying on her feet. Carl caught her as her knees buckled. He found a cabin with a couch and then hunted for the ship's stores. There was water, gallons of it, and he found some biscuits. For the next half hour they sat in the cabin sipping water and gnawing at the biscuits. The girl kept looking out of the port. How could anything as big as that live out here? She asked. There's so little food, so little water. I've heard reports of these snakes in the Lucerian desert, Carl said. The biologists say they are a hangover from an old type of animal. They don't have a carbon system metabolism. Their chemical system is based on silicon, and they can grind up pebbles and small boulders and get nourishment out of them. They have teeth like rock crushers. Rock crushers? The girl shuddered. Carl stood up. Get your mind off it, he said. See if you can find us something a little more substantial to eat. I'm going to look over the ship and see if I can figure out how to operate it. He was still checking instruments when the girl came to the door of the control room twenty minutes later. Well? I think I can run it, Carl said. Everything seems to be standard except for one thing. He pointed to the square box on the table by the panel. There's a mess of tubes and coils in there that don't make any sense. They must be important. They're connected by wires to the cables that run down the ridges in the hull. If that doesn't have anything to do with the controls, why can't you just forget about it? The girl said. Carl frowned at the box. Above the twisted lever was the word reduction. There was an arrow showing which direction the lever should be moved. I found something to eat, the girl said. They walked back to the cabin that had evidently been made for a small dining room. The girl sat down opposite him, and Carl suddenly stiffened in his chair. She was transformed. Her hair was soft and shiny again. The gray dust was gone from her skin. She had found some silky green cloth and made an impromptu skirt and a cross-hatch halter above. He looked down at his torn clothes, felt the gritty powder on his arms and legs. She laughed. It's at the end of the hall, she said. The shower was warm, and there was soap that smelled like spices. 
As Carl rubbed himself dry on the big yellow towel, he looked around at the soft green and black tiles and thought, if this is the life of a crackpot, I'm all for it. The meal and the sight of the girl opposite did something to him. When he walked back to the control cabin, he was whistling. The girl came and stood in the doorway. Are you going to try and get through the net? She asked in a nervous voice. Now don't get worried, he said. If Dekmar got through, the ship must have some protection around the hull. He started up the rockets and boosted the ship gently off the sand. After two wide circles over the desert to get the feel of the controls, he pointed her up and turned on the power. The girl moved over into the acceleration seat. Out of the corner of his eye, Carl saw her strap herself in. She gripped the arms tightly. Her face was pale. The net was a thousand miles up. When the altimeter showed eight hundred miles, Carl slowed down and felt his way along. At nine hundred, the controls began to drag. He shut off the power and the ship dropped back. The controls were freed. He tried it again, nosing up slowly. This time the levers almost jammed before he could shut off the power. The ship fell, whirling and looping crazily. It dropped 500 miles before he could pull it out. Carl was sweating when he brought it down gently on the desert. Let's not try that again, the girl said. Carl stared out at the sky. I see how they're doing it, he said. They have a power plant sustained on an anti-gravity ray somewhere above the Rapathian Mountains, and it shoots out a beam shaped like an umbrella clear across the solar system. He swung around to the control panel. Still, Dekmar got through. He reached across and fingered the dial of the little box on the table. Do you think we ought to fool with that? The girl asked. We can't stay out on this desert forever, can we? Besides, if we don't get that information back to the home government offices pretty soon, it'll be too late. He found a switch at the back of the box and pressed it. A strange throbbing ran through the ship. Carl moved the twisted lever gingerly in the direction of the arrow. Sparks shot out of the loose contact points and the throbbing speeded up. The girl cried out, Look, the rocks are changing! Carl spun around in the chair. For a second, he thought his eyes had gone bad. The rocks outside the port were swelling up out of the desert like balloons. He realized what it was. Reduction, of course. It's not the rocks, it's us. We're getting smaller. Outside the port, little pebbles were expanding into gigantic rough-hewn boulders. But I don't feel any different, the girl said. Of course not. Carl had to raise his voice above the throb of the reducer. Everything inside the ship gets smaller proportionately. The ridges on the outside of the hull must create a field. He turned back to the panel. And I've got a hunch this is going to get us through the net. He leaned over to the table and moved the lever down another notch. The girl came over beside him. Look, Carl said, the net acts on big things. If we were reduced to the size of bacteria, there wouldn't be enough power concentrated in one spot to affect the controls. We would slip through. The rocket rolled suddenly as a flat sand surface under it became an uneven plane of craggy rock. Carl turned on the keel jets and lifted the ship clear. He looked out at the faces of sand grains that had expanded to glassy mirror-like sheets. The ship's about two inches long, he thought. His stomach felt as if it had a lead ball in it. He tried the controls. The ship responded perfectly. But we can't keep getting smaller, the girl said. You just can't keep concentrating a thing. Now take it easy, Carl said. Evidently, there's some sort of a mass dissipator connected with this. I don't know how it works, but Dekmar must have known what he was doing. With a jerk, he started the tail jets and the ship roared forward and upward. The air was no longer clear. It was filled with hundreds of little particles that bumped gently against the hull. The girl started back when one touched the port. Dust particles, Carl said. At our size, they look big. He turned on full power. The ship spurted upward through a gray storm. The dust, Carl saw, was not impeding their progress. The particles touched the hull and bounced away.
He set a course for Earth and turned on the interplanetary drive. At this size, they would need speed to get anywhere. With his hands still on the controls, he turned to the girl. Move it back to zero, he said, jerking his head toward the box on the table. But don't shut off the switch. I don't want to take any chances of the ship going back to its original size. The girl shoved back the lever slowly. The throbbing noise sank to a low, surging sound. The lever's loose, she said. Just be careful with it. She came back to the port. The air's clear now. I think that means we're in the beam, Carl said. Ionized air would dispel the particles. He felt the ship buck slightly. Through the port, he could see flashes of blue light crackling along the hull. He jiggled the controls. They were a little tight, but they weren't jammed. Suddenly, he felt them come free. At the same moment, something bumped the hull. It's a dust particle, the girl said. She pressed her face against the port, staring forward. It's as big as a house. Carl laughed. We're through. He checked the course to make sure it was set for Earth, locked the controls, and stepped over to push off the reducer switch. Afterwards, he thought that his elbow must have hit the lever as he reached for the switch. It happened too fast to be sure. He was aware only of the blinding blue flash and the jerking contraction of his muscles. When he came to, the girl was kneeling over him, wiping his face with something wet and cold. His ears were aching with the throbbing scream coming from the reducer. The lever to it was lying on the floor. How long have I been out? He had to yell to make himself heard. About fifteen minutes. He started to get up and pain like a knife stab shot through his skull. He eased back and felt his head. You hit a ledge on the bulkhead, she shouted. I bandaged it. I tried artificial respiration, ammonia, everything. I thought you'd never come to. He shook his head and stared at the table. Suddenly he began to laugh. Automatic control, he yelled, pointing to the letters that were flashing on and off. It says automatic control. What a joke, there isn't any control. He saw the girl watching him, saw the fear in her eyes, the tight line of her lips. It sobered him instantly. He struggled to his feet. Let's get out of this racket, he yelled. They crossed the alleyway to a little cabin, and Carl closed the airtight door. The reducer was still screaming, but it sounded far away. Carl leaned against the door, listening. It was like a siren out of control, climbing, climbing. I've got to stop that thing somehow, he said. You can't get near it, the girl said. I tried once myself when you were lying on the floor. I touched the table and the shock almost jerked my arm off. But can't you see? I've got to stop it. If we don't, we'll shrink. We'll shrink to the size of a molecule, an atom, an electron, and then, well, there isn't anything smaller. We'll disintegrate into a quantum of energy or something. Wait! Carl took his hand off the door latch and turned around. All right, then, she said quietly. Let it happen that way. I'd rather have it like that than seeing you on the floor again, blue and not breathing. Carl looked at her eyes that were calm now and steady. He thought, and I was scared to death she was going to crack up. He said, I'm going to try and cut the wires to the thing anyway. If we can shut off the current supply, it'll stop. He stepped out into the screeching din of the alleyway. They found a small torch in the ship's stores, and Carl tried cutting the metal bulkhead on the outside of the control cabin where he calculated the current supply would run. The metal was hard, and the torch cut slowly. After ten minutes, he pushed up his mask and took a breather. The bulkhead was hardly marked. Carl tapped it. Must be another of Dekmar's inventions, he yelled at the girl. He put down the mask and tried again. Finally, he gave up and shut the torch off. He walked to the doorway of the control room. He took out his heat gun and aimed it at the box. The blue sphere of flame did not reach it. It stopped short about a foot away and splattered as if it were ricocheting against something hard. Carl tried it from another angle, another. The gun began to heat up under his hand, but an invisible shell of energy blocked off its beam from the box. He walked back into the cabin across the alleyway. 
The girl came in behind him and fastened the door. Carl laid the hot gun on the table. Well, I guess that's that, he said. He sat down on a bench by the port and contemplated the deck. The girl came over and sat beside him. For a long time, she gazed out through the glass, saying nothing, and then in a weak voice she asked, Do you suppose those are molecules? Carl looked up. Outside was a tremendously enlarged section of a dust particle. It was almost transparent and made up of little dots that jerked to and fro. I suppose so, he said, trying to keep his voice steady. Molecules, he thought. Molecules, then atoms, then electrons, and then... He closed his eyes and tried to banish the dancing dots from his mind. He could feel his heart thumping heavily in his chest. When he opened his eyes again, the dots had expanded. Each dot, he saw, was made of colored spheres arranged in a pattern, four blue, one red, and two orange. The patterns twisted slowly, passing through one another like squads of soldiers in a complicated drill, yet all the time holding their arrangement. Far out from the port, he saw another group of three green and two yellow spheres. The scream of the reducer went up another notch. The lights in the ship dimmed and went out. It's drawing off all the current, Carl said. Splashes of red and blue light were playing over the girl's body. She moved closer to him, wide eyes fixed on the port. Carl felt her fingers searching for his hand. A red sphere floated up to the port. It bulged and faded to a blurred pink, and the pink was darting lights that spread out, enclosing the ship. This is an atom, Carl thought. We're inside an atom. The tightness around his chest grew into a constricting pain. Then far out in the distance, the core of the red sphere swung into view, a mass of glittering diamonds. It drifted toward them, holding its shape till Carl was certain it was going to crash the ship. Then it separated, and one diamond hung before the port. Carl, gripping the girl's hand, waited for a ripping explosion that would send them into nothingness. The explosion did not come. The trembling light floated toward them and slowly dissolved into silvery powder that spread itself across a backdrop of blackness. Staggering up to the port, Carl dragged the girl with him. Distant points of light hurtled past them. The ship was plunging into an abyss. No, it was plunging toward one of the tiny white points of light that was expanding, brightening into a ball, a sphere, a gigantic solid sphere with a scarred surface with... Carl was aware that his ears were ringing. The reducer had shut off, its scream replaced by the deep, familiar roar of tail jets. The girl was shaking his arm and pointing. Don't you recognize it? she asked. Don't you recognize it? And of course, he did recognize it, even though every ounce of logic in his makeup rebelled when he finally said, Yes, it's the Earth. The landmass right in front of us is North America. He went into the control cabin and shut off the interplanetary drive. It was quite a few minutes later, when they were skimming over the peaks of the Rockies with everything ready for a landing, before the pieces began to fit together in his mind. You know, he said slowly, I guess it does make sense. We say space is curved. We say a beam of light, if it went far enough, would end up at its starting point. In fact, some astronomers say that nebulae in one part of the sky might be the same nebulae we see in another part of the sky, and we're actually seeing them twice because the light has traveled clear around the universe. Well, then, if the universe is curved and self-contained in one way, it must be curved and self-contained in every way. It's like the old symbol of the serpent swallowing its own tail. Carl looked over his shoulder. Are you listening? She was frowning at the shiny plates in the after bulkhead. Yes, I'm listening. Carl turned back. He studied the topography unreeling itself on the visiplate and eased back the accelerator lever a trifle. The way I see it, if light comes back to its starting point, there is no infinitely distant place. In the same way, there would be no infinitely small size. There's no end or beginning to anything, and if you travel far enough in any one direction, you always come back to where you started from. Do you follow me? Well, she kept staring at the after bulkhead. 
Did you ever study Kant? Kant? Yes, he's a very ancient German philosopher, lived way back when they didn't have a world government or anything. It was all in a required philosophy course I took at the university. I always steered clear of philosophy, she said. She did not take her eyes off the afterplates. Well, this fellow Kant claimed that time and space were just creations of our own minds, and he tried to prove it by extending the logical implications of them into the structure of the universe till they contradicted themselves and became meaningless. Let's see, how did he put it? Carl leaned back in the pilot's chair and scratched his head. First of all, he said the universe must be finite because it's made up of the sum of its parts, and as its parts are units, you could never add up finite units and get infinity. Then he took the other side of the argument and pointed out that if it was finite, it must have limits, and if it has limits, it has limits in relation to something beyond it, and the universe is everything that is, so there couldn't be anything beyond except more universe, and if it keeps on going like that, it isn't finite. But it's not infinite either, so what is it? The girl started to say something, but Carl held up his hand. Wait a minute, I'm not through. Kant's conclusion was that space and time were handy man-made illusions, but maybe it's the idea of infinity that's the man-made illusion. It's the idea of infinity and beginnings and endings that cross you up when you try to reason how small things can become, or how large the universe can be. We admit the universe is curved and self-contained in one way when we say light returns to its starting point. It must be curved and self-contained every other way, too. And just as there's no infinite distance, there's no infinite size, large or small. Whichever way you look at it, it's part of a circle, and if you travel far enough in any one direction, you always come back to the place you started from. Maybe exploding atoms and expanding galaxies are the same things from different points of view. He took a breath. Now, what were you going to say? Are we going to land at Francisco City? It took him a few seconds to get his mind down to the question. Those were the orders that came through 15 minutes ago. What's worrying you? There'll be visigraph reporters and cameramen, won't there? Carl twisted around in his seat to see what it was she kept looking at. It dawned suddenly. The shiny after bulkhead plates made a perfect mirror. All that time, then, he had been talking to himself. She probably hadn't even been trying to listen. Don't tell me you're nervous. No, but... She spread out the fold of her silky shirt. Do you think this looks funny? It's just a piece of an old parachute. Carl hung on to the controls till the dizziness cleared from his head. She dragged herself across the Martian desert, she fell through a hole in the universe, and you were scared to death all the time for fear she'd go to pieces, and she comes out of it worrying about the cut of her dress. You look fine, Carl said. You look wonderful. And as he circled the field and brought the ship down on the runway, it dawned on him that she really did look wonderful, and in two minutes she would be stepping out of the ship and maybe out of his life for keeps. He got up from the pilot's chair and caught her before she reached the hatch. Thela, he said, there's a crowd of people out there. I'll be taken to the director's office right away to answer questions about the ship, and the government officials will be quizzing you all night about everything we found out and... Yes? She moved away from him, eyes narrowing. After it's over, let's get together. To discuss some technical aspects of space curvature, perhaps? You... He started to pull her to him, but she twisted away. She was looking at the ports, jammed now with peering faces. I'm listed in the consular directory like all the other employees, she said. She smiled and opened the hatch. Two government officials helped her down into the crowd. He watched her walk away and kept thinking about the smile. It was like the reducer. You thought things were over with, and then you suddenly realized they were just beginning. End of The Long Way Back by John Barrett To Be or Not to Be by Kurt Vonnegut This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Seth Wayne. Everything went perfectly swell. There were no prisons, no slums, no insane asylums, no cripples, no poverty, no wars. 
All diseases were conquered. So was old age. Death, barring accidents, was an adventure for volunteers. The population of the United States was stabilized at 40 million souls. One bright morning in the Chicago Lion Inn Hospital, a man named Edward K. Welling Jr. waited for his wife to give birth. He was the only man waiting. Not many people were born a day anymore. Welling was 56, a mere stripling in a population whose average was 129. X-rays had revealed that his wife was going to have triplets. The children would be his first. Young Welling was hunched in his chair, his head in his hand. He was so rumpled, so still and colorless as to be virtually invisible. His camouflage was perfect, since the waiting room had a disorderly and demoralized air, too. Chairs and ashtrays had been moved away from the walls. The floor was paved with spattered drop cloths. The room was being redecorated. It was being redecorated as a memorial to a man who had volunteered to die. A sardonic old man, about 200 years old, sat on a stepladder, painting a mural he did not like. Back in the days when people aged visibly, his age would have been guessed at 35 or so. Aging had touched him that much before the cure for aging was found. The mural he was working on depicted a very neat garden. Men and women in white, doctors and nurses, turned the soil, planted seedlings, sprayed bugs, and spread fertilizer. Men and women in purple uniforms pulled up weeds, cut down plants that were old and sickly, raked leaves, carried refuge to trash burners. Never, 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 not even in medieval Holland nor old Japan, had a garden been more formal than better tended. Every plant had all the loam, light, water, air, and nourishment it could use. A hospital orderly came down the corridor, singing under his breath a popular song. If you don't like my kisses, honey, here's what I will do. I'll go see a girl in purple, kiss the sad world toodaloo. If you don't want my lovin', why should I take up all the space? I'll get off this old planet, let some sweet baby have my place. The orderly looked in at the mural and the muralist. Look so real, he said. I can practically imagine I'm standing in the middle of it. What makes you think you're not in it, said the painter. He gave a satiric smile. It's called the happy garden of life, you know. That's good of Dr. Hitz, said the orderly. He was referring to one of the male figures in white, whose head was the portrait of Dr. Benjamin Hitz, the hospital's chief obstetrician. Hitz was a blindingly handsome man. Lots of faces to fill in, said the orderly. He meant that the faces of many of the figures in the mural were still blank. All blanks were to be filled with portraits of important people on either the hospital staff or from the Chicago office of the Federal Bureau of Termination. Must be nice to be able to make pictures that look like something, said the orderly. The painter's face curdled with scorn. You think I'm proud of this daub, he said. You think this is my idea of what life really looks like? What's your idea of what life looks like, said the orderly. The painter gestured at a foul drop cloth. There's a good picture of it, he said. Frame that, and you'll have a picture a damn sight more honest than this one. You're a gloomy old duck, aren't you? Is that a crime, said the painter. The orderly shrugged. If you don't like it here, Grandpa, he said, and he finished the thought with the trick telephone number that people who didn't want to live anymore were supposed to call. The zero in the telephone number he pronounced naught. The number was 2BR naught 2B. It was the telephone number of an institution whose fanciful sobriquets included Automat, Birdland, Canary, Cat Box, D. Louser, Easy Go, Goodbye Mother, Happy Hooligan, Kiss Me Quick, Lucky Pierre, Sheep Dip, Wearing Blender, Weep No More, and Why Worry?
To be or not to be was the telephone number of the municipal gas chambers of the Federal Bureau of Termination. The painter thumbed his nose at the orderly. When I decide it's time to go, he said, it won't be at the sheep dip. A do-it-yourselfer, eh? said the orderly. Messy business, Grandpa. Why don't you have a little consideration for the people have to clean up after you? The painter expressed with an obscenity his lack of concern for the tribulations of his survivors. The world could do with a good deal more mess if you ask me, he said. And the orderly laughed and moved on. Welling, the waiting father, mumbled something without raising his head, and then he fell silent again. A coarse, formidable woman strode into the waiting room on spike heels. Her shoes, stockings, trench coat, bag, and overseas cap were all purple. The purple the painter called the color of grapes on Judgment Day. The medallion on her purple musette bag was the seal of the service division of the Federal Bureau of Termination, an eagle perched on a turnstile. The woman had a lot of facial hair, an unmistakable mustache, in fact. A curious thing about gas chamber hostesses was that, no matter how lovely and feminine they were when recruited, they all sprouted mustaches within five years or so. Is this where I'm supposed to come now? She said to the painter. A lot would depend on what your business was, he said. You aren't about to have a baby, are you? They told me I was supposed to pose for some pictures, she said. My name's Leora Duncan, she waited. And you dunk people, he said. What, she said. Skip it, he said. That sure is a beautiful picture, she said. Looks just like heaven or something. Or something, said the painter. He took a list of names from his smock pocket. Duncan, 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 he said, scanning the list. Yes, here you are. You're entitled to be immortalized. See any faceless body here you'd like me to stick your head on? We've got a few choice ones left. She studied the mural bleakly. Gee, she said, they're all the same to me. I don't know anything about art. A body's a body, eh, he said. All righty, as a master of fine art, I recommend this body here. He indicated a faceless figure of a woman who was carrying dried stalks to a trash burner. Well, said Leora Duncan, that's more the disposal people, isn't it? I mean, I'm in service. I don't do any disposing. The painter clapped his hands in mock delight. You say you don't know anything about art, and then you prove in the next breath that you know more about it than I do. Of course, the sheave carrier is wrong for a hostess. A snipper, a pruner, that's more your line. He pointed to a figure in purple who was sawing a dead branch from an apple tree. How about her, he said. You like her at all? Gosh, she said, and she blushed and became humble. That, that puts me right next to Dr. Hitz. That upset you, he said. Good gravy, no, she said. It's, it's just such an honor. Uh, you, you admire him, huh, he said. Who doesn't admire him, she said, worshipping the portrait of Hitz. It was the portrait of a tanned, white-haired, omnipotent Zeus, 240 years old. Who doesn't admire him, she said again, He was responsible for setting up the very first gas chamber in Chicago. Nothing would please me more, said the painter, than to put you next to him for all time. Sawing off a limb, that strikes you as appropriate? That is kind of like what I do, she said. She was demure about what she did. What she did was make people comfortable while she killed them. And while Leora Duncan was posing for her portrait, into the waiting room bounded Dr. Hitz himself. He was seven feet tall, and he boomed with importance, accomplishments, and the joy of living. Well, Miss Duncan, Miss Duncan, he said, and he made a joke. What are you doing here, he said. This isn't where the people leave. This is where they come in. We're going to be in the same picture together, she said shyly. 
Good, said Dr. Hitz heartily. And say, isn't that some picture? I sure am honored to be in it with you, she said. Let me tell you, he said, I'm honored to be in it with you. Without women like you, this wonderful world we've got wouldn't be possible. He saluted her and moved toward the door that led to the delivery rooms. Guess what was just born, he said. I can't, she said. Triplets, he said. Triplets, she said. She was exclaiming over the legal implications of triplets. The law said that no newborn child could survive unless the parents of the child could find someone who would volunteer to die. Triplets, if they were all to live, called for three volunteers. Do the parents have three volunteers, said Leora Duncan. Last I heard, said Dr. Hitz, they had one and were trying to scrape another two up. I don't think they made it, she said. Nobody made three appointments with us. Nothing but singles going through today. Unless somebody called in after I left. What's the name? Welling, said the waiting father, sitting up, red-eyed and frowsy. Edward K. Welling, Jr. is the name of the happy father-to-be. He raised his right hand, looked at a spot on the wall, gave a hoarsely wretched chuckle. Present, he said. Oh, Mr. Welling, said Dr. Hitz. I didn't see you. The invisible man, said Welling. They just phoned me that your triplets have been born, said Dr. Hitz. They're all fine, and so is the mother. I'm on my way in to see them now. Hooray, said Welling emptily. You don't sound very happy, said Dr. Hitz. What man in my shoes wouldn't be happy, said Welling. He gestured with his hands to symbolize carefree simplicity. All I have to do is pick out which one of the triplets is going to live, then deliver my maternal grandfather to the happy hooligan and come back here with a receipt. Dr. Hitz became rather severe with Welling, towered over him. You don't believe in population control, Mr. Welling, he said. I think it's perfectly keen, said Welling tautly. Would you like to go back to the good old days when the population of the earth was 20 billion, about to become 40 billion, then 80 billion, then 160 billion? Do you know what a druplet is, Mr. Welling, said Hitz. Nope, said Welling sulkily. A druplet, Mr. Welling, is one of the little knobs, one of the little pulpy grains of a blackberry, said Dr. Hitz. Without population control, human beings would now be packed on the surface of this old planet like truplets on a blackberry. Think of it. Welling continued to stare at the same spot on the wall. In the year 2000, said Dr. Hitz, before scientists stepped in and laid down the law, there wasn't even enough drinking water to go around and nothing to eat but seaweed. And still, people insisted on their right to reproduce like jackrabbits. And their right, if possible, to live forever. I want those kids, said Welling quietly. I want all three of them. Of course you do, said Dr. Hitz. That's only human. I don't want my grandfather to die either, said Welling. Nobody's really happy about taking a close relative to the cat box, said Dr. Hitz gently, sympathetically. I wish people wouldn't call it that, said Leora Duncan. What? said Dr. Hitz. I wish people wouldn't call it the cat box and things like that, she said. It gives people the wrong impression. You're absolutely right, said Dr. Hitz. Forgive me. He corrected himself, gave the municipal gas chambers their official title, a title no one ever used in conversation. I should have said ethical suicide studios, he said. That sounds so much better, said Leora Duncan. This child of yours, whichever one you decide to keep, Mr. Welling, said Dr. Hitz, he or she is going to live on a happy, roomy, clean, rich planet thanks to population control in a garden like that mural there. He shook his head. Two centuries ago when I was a young man, it was a hell that nobody thought could last another 20 years. 
Now, centuries of peace and plenty stretch before us as far as the imagination cares to travel. He smiled luminously. The smile faded as he saw that Welling had just drawn a revolver. Welling shot Dr. Hitz dead. There's room for one, a great big one, he said. And then he shot Leora Duncan. It's only death, he said to her as she fell. There, room for two. And then he shot himself, making room for all three of his children. Nobody came running. Nobody seemingly heard the shots. The painter sat on the top of his stepladder, looking down reflectively on the sorry scene. The painter pondered the mournful puzzle of life, demanding to be born, and once born, demanding to be fruitful, to multiply and to live as long as possible, to do all that on a very small planet that would have to last forever. All the answers that the painter could think of were grim, even grimmer, surely, than a cat box, a happy hooligan, an easy go. He thought of war. He thought of plague. He thought of starvation. He knew that he would never paint again. He let his paintbrush fall to the drop cloths below, and then he decided he had had about enough of life in the happy garden of life, too, and he came slowly down from the ladder. He took Welling's pistol, really intending to shoot himself, but he didn't have the nerve. And then he saw the telephone booth in the corner of the room. He went to it, dialed the well-remembered number, 2 br not to be Federal Bureau of Termination, said the very warm voice of a hostess. How soon could I get an appointment, he asked, speaking very carefully. We could probably fit you in late this afternoon, sir, she said. It might even be earlier if we get a cancellation. All right, said the painter. Fit me in, if you please. And he gave her his name, spelling it out. Thank you, sir said the hostess. Your city thanks you, your country thanks you, your planet thanks you. But the deepest thanks of all is from future generations. End of To Be or Not To Be by Kurt Vonnegut The Natives by Catherine McLean This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nora Trapp. The Natives by Catherine McLean The old one said, Stick close by me, child. What'll it be like, Grandpa? The youngster was frightened. Dark, very dark and big. It moves fast, but we'll keep up with it. The tone was consciously reassuring. Dark, Grandpa. Yes, it sucks heat and absorbs light. You will find out when you're old and strong enough to swim down to the bottom and see what's there. Now stay with me when we follow it, and don't get lost in the crowd, and don't get ahead of me or get too close to it. You might take in too much and get overcharged. What's overcharged, Grandpa? Can you really get too much? The youngster jigged up and down a little with excitement and anticipation. For a moment, the oldster turned his attention from watching for the thing that was coming and considered him fondly. Or oh, youngling, I forget. You've had no chance to learn what it means to get enough. You're too young to ride the storms and tap the lightnings. Listen now. When a grown-up has to let out a flash of blue light, that means that he's overcharged and spinning off balance inside, and so he has to save himself by letting out his energy to let down the pressure. So be careful. Take enough, but don't be greedy and take in too much too suddenly. Now let's just float here with the others and be ready. It was a beautiful bright day. The sun poured down its flood of light here and there, energizing a molecule of the blue air into little sparkles of ionization. And below, 
A mist of bright clouds half veiled the darkness that was the bottom. What's it mean when someone blinks blue light in lots of flashes and then glows red and starts sinking, huh, Grandpa? I'll tell you when you're older. Just be careful and don't get too close. He was abruptly excited. Here it comes. Out of the blue translucence far below, a black dot appeared and grew rapidly rushing closer until it was a huge, fish-shaped object with widespread fins rushing towards them. It would pass slightly to the left of them, and already the waiting crowd was moving to intercept it. It flashed by, and the youngster thought they were going to lose it. It was going so much faster than they. But as the thought crossed his mind, and he saw the two turning, glowing openings in its rear, a burning blast of energy struck him. A multitude of glowing, charged particles crackled around him, streamed against him. His field shifted to reach out and capture them. The spin of stored energy within spun faster, absorbing the new energy into its drive, its life pulse rising to a deep hum, and he felt strong, stronger than he had ever felt before in his life. They were flying faster now, accelerating faster than he had ever flown, and it was easy. They drew up closer to the dark thing, matching at speed for speed, laving in the glowing cloud of energy particles that roared backward from its jets. The youngster was astounded and exhilarated at the tremendous, effortless speed with which they were driving forward. This was the first time he had ever had so much power. It was ten times more than any aurora borealis with its pale wash of energy waves. Drunken in his newfound strength, he pulled ahead closer to the roaring jets. At the peak of the arc of climb of the New York Istanbul Stratoliner, high in the ionosphere where the Earth was merely a giant globe far below, the pilot of the Stratoliner boredly cut the jets for the fuel-saving glide that turned their nose toward Earth again. The radar was clanging its usual senseless warning of imminent collision with some solid objects which had approached closer than the automatic relays considered safe. It had been clinging for several minutes. The pilot glanced in annoyance at the radar screen, where several hundred globes, from two to seven feet in diameter, showed vividly, trailing the ship in a fan-shaped cluster. Someday I'm going to take a hammer to that thing. The co-pilot, Looking back from the control blister's rear window, saw nothing, as usual, except a few of the shining globes which showed themselves transiently in a brief flash of blue light as they carelessly overloaded and discharged, and one, smaller than the rest, who blinked on and off rapidly in brilliant flashes of blue. As he watched, it ran suddenly down the color scale to red and began to lag behind, a glowing red globe, sinking I wonder what the hell they think they're doing, he grumbled. End of the Natives by Catherine McLean From Beyond the Stars by Murray Leinster This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Beyond the Stars by Murray Leinster Tommy Driscoll lay on his stomach in the grass outside his father's laboratory and read his comic books. He was ten years old and wholly innocent of any idea that fate or chance, or destiny, might make use of him to make the comic books come true. He was clad in grubby shorts, with sandals, and no socks or blouse. Ants crawled on his legs as he lay on the ground, and he absently scratched them off. To the adult eye he was merely the son of that Professor Driscoll, who taught advanced physics at Harwell College, and in summer vacation putted around with research. As such, 
Tommy was inconsiderable from any standpoint except that of fate or chance or destiny. They had use for him. He was, however, wholly and triumphantly a normal small boy. As he scratched thoughtfully and absorbed the pictures in his comic book, he was Space Captain McGee of the rocket cruiser Omadoom, gloriously defeating, for the fifteenth time since he had acquired the book, the dastardly scheme of the dictator of Pluto to enslave the human race to the green-skinned, stock-eyed denizens of that dark planet. A little while since, he had been the Star Rover, crimson-cloaked and crimson-masked, and mysteriously endowed with the power to survive, unharmed, the frigidity and airlessness of interstellar space. As the Star Rover, he had triumphantly smashed the attempt of some very unpleasant Mercurians to wipe out the human race so that they could emigrate to Earth. As both splendid figures, at satisfyingly frequent intervals, Tommy had swung mighty blows at the jaws or midriffs of Mercurians, green-skinned Plutonians, renegade Earthmen, and others. But he had just finished reading both comics three times in succession. He heaved a sigh of comfortable mental repletion and rolled over, imagining further splendid if formless adventures with spaceships and ray guns. Locusts whirred monotonously in the maple trees of Harwell College campus. His father's laboratory was a small stone structure off the physics building, and Tommy waited for his father and Professor Wardle to come out. When they did, he would walk home with them and, possibly, acquire an ice cream cone on the way. With luck, he might wangle another comic. He heard his father's voice, talking to Professor Wardle, who was spending the weekend with them. There's the setup, said his father inside the laboratory. Absurd, perhaps, but this Jansky radiation bothers me. I've found out one rather startling thing about it. My dear fellow, Professor Wardle said dryly, if you publish anything about the Jansky radiation, the newspapers will accuse you of communicating with Mars. Tommy knew by his father's tone that he was grinning. I've not thought of anything so conservative. Everybody knows that the Jansky radiation comes from the direction of the Milky Way and from beyond the solar system. It makes a hissing noise in a sensitive shortwave receiver. No modulation has ever been detected, but no explanation's been offered either. Professor Wardle moved inside the laboratory. What's the startling fact you've discovered? he asked. It's got a point source, Tommy Driscoll's father said, and Tommy could tell he was still grinning. It comes from one spot. There's a second-order effect in our atmosphere which has masked it up to now. I can prove it. Tommy chewed on a grass stem. As the son of a professor of physics, he was disillusioned about scientists. They were not like the scientists of the comic books, who were mostly mad geniuses with plans to make themselves emperors of Earth and had to be foiled by Captain McGee or the Star Rover. Tommy knew pessimistically that scientists just talk long words like his father now. But Professor Wardle seemed startled. A point source? But confound it, man. That would mean it's artificial, not natural. That it was a signal from beyond the stars. What else could it mean? I'd like to know myself, 
said Tommy's father ruefully. I've checked for interruptions like dots and dashes and for modulations like our radio. I've made sure it, it isn't frequency modulated. The only thing left is television. Therefore the television screen, said Professor Wardle. I see. You're trying to analyze it with a scanning system. Hmm, possible. But if it is a signal from another solar system... Tommy Driscoll sat up straight, his eyes wide and astonished. His mouth formed itself into a particularly round O. This, of course, was the natural occurrence if fate or chance or destiny was to use him to make the comic books come true. He had been listening with only a fraction of his ears. To a ten-year-old boy, adults do not often seem intelligent. Few of them have any interest in Space Captain McGee or the Star Rover. But Tommy's father was talking about interplanetary communication, of signals from the planets of another sun, from creatures who might be superintelligent vegetables like the Wangos the star rover had to fight, or immaterial entities like those misty things that almost defeated Captain McGee on the ghost planet because when he swung his mighty fist there wasn't anything solid for him to hit. Tommy's father was talking about things like that. He got up and gazed in the open door of the small laboratory. He regarded the rather messy assemblage of equipment on the workbench with bright-eyed, respectful awe. His father nodded. Hello, Captain, he said to his son. No hot wires around. Come in. What's on your mind? Tommy's eyes shone. Uh, you were talking about signals from another planet? I see, said his father. Right up your alley, eh? I hadn't realized the popular appeal, but if you'd like to listen... Tommy fairly quivered with eagerness. His father threw a switch. There was a tiny hum from a loudspeaker, then silence. Then, presently, there was a tiny hissing noise. Just a hissing noise, nothing else. That's it, Captain, his father told Tommy. That's the noise the Jansky radiation makes. When we turn this dial, we tune it out this way, he demonstrated. And also when we turn the dial that way. Then we tune it back in. He proved it. Nobody has ever explained it, but it comes from outer space. I think it comes from just one spot. Professor Wardle, smoking a pipe and sprawled in a chair, nodded amiably at Tommy. Yes, sir, Tommy said, thrilled. His throat went dry from excitement. His father threw a second switch. A television screen glowed faintly. Now it's transferred to the screen, he told Tommy. But it's still all scrambled. Nothing happens. It's quite a job to unscramble a television signal, even when you know all about the transmitter. If there's a transmitter sending this, I don't know any of its constants. Over Tommy's head, he said to Professor Wardle, The possible combination runs ten to the ninth. Professor Wardle nodded. Lines per inch, size of screen, images per second, possible colors. He grunted. Then the scanning pattern and possible three dimensions and so on. You've got several billion possible variations, all right. Unscramble it, Dad, said Tommy eagerly. Please, 
I want to see what the people look like who's sending it. Do you think we can lick them if they get tough? I'm telling you, his father explained, that I can try several billion ways to unscramble this supposed signal. Even if it can be done, only one of them will be right. It's going to take time. But, Dad, please try. Tommy was filled with infinite excitement. Which, of course, was not only necessary if the comic books were to be made to come true, but was wholly normal small boy. Here was an interstellar signal. He had heard it. Tune the set right and he would see maybe something like the giraffe men who almost killed Captain McGee on the planet of sand. Or the frogmen the star rover had to fight when a crippled space liner was forced to descend on the watery planet Alith. I've got to figure out a way to unscramble it, Tommy, his father said. I've got to calculate the settings that are most likely to show some change on the screen. It's rather like breaking a code. It will take a couple of weeks to compute a series of settings to try one after the other. Tommy was unconvinced. He argued. Space Captain McGee's friend, Doc Blandy, would simply have whipped out his trusty slide rule and made the computations in seconds. He would push the slide back and forth, set the television controls according to his computations, and say, On the beam, McGee! and Space Captain McGee would gaze into the television screen and see the worm monsters of Blathok about to chloroform Jenny, Captain McGee's girlfriend, to transfer the brain of a worm monster into her skull. Her body would thereafter house an inveterate enemy to the human race with specific plans for annihilating it. Tommy argued, impassionedly, in the end, his father had to resort to authority to stop his arguing, and then Tommy was tempted to revert to his former disillusionment about scientists. But continued belief offered high reward in excitement. So he believed. Still, it was a rebellious small boy who accompanied his father and Professor Wardle home. Even the expected ice cream cone did not console him. He consumed it in an avid gloom. His father tried to comfort him. After all, we're not sure, he told Tommy. It might not be a signal at all, or it might be a signal of a type that would seem simple enough to the creature who sent it, but hopelessly complicated to us. They might be so much farther advanced in science. In any case, it's not a thing to be solved offhand. But you're going to try, aren't you, Dad? asked Tommy desperately. You said it wouldn't do any harm. You said we could lick them. They couldn't harm Earth. I'll try, his father assured him. It's simply useless to go it blind. That's all. I'll have my calculations done in a couple of weeks, and you can watch while I try the whole business, all right? Tommy gulped. He was unable to speak for disappointment. When one is ten years old, odds of billions to one are negligible, but two weeks of waiting is eternity. It is exactly the same as never. And this, too, was not only in the necessary pattern of things if the comic books were to come true, but it was perfectly natural small boy. That night, Tommy went rebelliously to bed the third time, he was told. He had hung around his father and Professor Wardle, listening hungrily to every incomprehensible word they said. He was keyed up to enormous excitement. He slept only fitfully. 
The comics had been a make-believe world in which he believed only with a book in his hand. Now they promised to become real, and he was filled with monstrous hunger for the adventure they promised. He woke at dawn, and his lurid, fitful dreams had made him ripe for desperate and daring deeds. He slipped into his shorts and sandals and went downstairs. He gulped a huge glass of milk and stuffed down an ample slice of cake. Then he came to a grand and desperate resolution. He slipped out the back door and trudged across the dew-wet campus to his father's laboratory. He wormed unseen into the small building. His heart beat fast. He was scared. But he was Space Captain McGee and the Star Rover all rolled into one in his own mind. And definitely he was ten-year-old Tommy Driscoll. He remembered, of course, how his father had turned on the shortwave set and the television screen. No small boy could forget those items. He sat down before the controls and threw the two switches with a grandly negligent gesture that Captain McGee himself could not have bettered. And then he started, blindly, but with infinite confidence, to unscramble the Jansky radiation. He was one half making believe, and one half deadly earnest, and all absolute faith. Naturally. The odds against any one setting of the controls being the right one to unscramble the Jansky radiation were several billion to one. But the heroes of comic books always win against odds like that. So did Tommy Driscoll. The comic books were fated to come true. The faintly glowing television screen quite impossibly flickered as he turned the controls. His heart pounded. He worked on, his eyes shining and his head far above the clouds, out in interstellar space with Captain McGee and the Star Rover. Presently, quite impossibly, the screen became a steadily pulsating rectangle, which, at its brightest, was very bright indeed. He found a maximum brightness on which he could not improve. He worked other controls at random. One made odd streaks appear on the screen. At the peak of streakiness, Tommy's heart was thumping in his throat. He, Tommy Driscoll, was about to make contact with the people of another planet, circling another distant sun. Another knob suddenly gathered together the streakings and the pulsations. They made the vaguest of patterns, and then the fuzziest of images. His hand shaking uncontrollably, Tommy Driscoll continued to turn that knob with the slowest possible movements. He had a flash of clearness, and his heart leaped. Then everything was fuzzy again. He turned the knob back, his breath coming in excited pantings. And then, in total defiance of the laws of chance, but in strict obedience to fate and destiny, there was abruptly a perfectly clear picture on the screen. It was not a picture of any place on earth, but of somewhere else, a place so alien in every respect that Tommy would never be able to describe it. And there was a thing looking out of the screen at Tommy Driscoll. His heart did multiple flip-flops, and he shook all over. But it shocked him much less than it would have shocked an adult, because he was wholly familiar with such apparitions from the comic books. 
This thing looked rather like the people on the planet Zmig, who had tried to wall up Captain McGee in a glassy pyramid so he would roast to death when their purple sun rose above the horizon. But also it looked rather like Mr. Schneider, who mowed the lawns on Faculty Row. And it grinned at Tommy. Hello, he said in a clear treble, which shook uncontrollably with his excitement. I'm Tommy Driscoll of Earth. We're friendly if you're friendly. We're tough if you're tough. How about it? This was an exact quotation from the comic book in which Captain McGee had made contact with the people of the system of the Twenty Suns, and, later, had to fight against swarms of spaceships which wanted to capture his star maps so they could find Earth and attack it treacherously without warning. The thing answered Tommy. It didn't use words, of course, but in the comic books, mind-to-mind -mind communication of alien peoples is common enough. Captain McGee had done it more than once, and the Star Rover frequently, wandering more widely than McGee as he did. Tommy knew what the thing was saying, and his piping small boy voice answered in his father's laboratory, and he knew that the thing understood him too. The comic books were, specifically, coming true. The thing spoke respectfully and cordially, though, of course, it did not really speak at all. Its people wanted to be friends with Earth, of course. They had been watching Earth with radar for centuries, so it told Tommy jovially. They knew that, sooner or later, Earthmen would roam the stars and benevolently rule all the planets of all the suns of the galaxy in which Earth is placed. Because, of course, Earth has uranium and other heavy metals supplying atomic energy, while other planets are not so fortunate. Tommy's eyes glowed. But he was extraordinarily composed, in the heroic calm of children in exciting make-believe. Oh, sure, said Tommy, largely to the thing of outer space. We're going to have a space patrol that will make all the people on, on all the planets behave. I'm going to be a captain in it. Maybe we'll come and visit you first of all. How far away are you? The thing could not tell Tommy in mind-to-mind -mind converse. The thought it had could not be translated into words by Tommy Driscoll's brain, but the distance was very great, and it explained quickly that they were able to talk over so vast a chasm as if face-to-face -face because of... Again... Tommy's brain was not able to translate the mental impressions he received. He could recognize the meanings the thing wanted to convey if the meanings were stored away in his memory, but, naturally, complex technical concepts were simply not in his vocabulary. The thing seemed satisfied to fail. Have you got spaceships and ray guns and gravity nullifiers and mysterious rays? asked Tommy eagerly. Our scientists haven't even made ray guns yet. The thing said that, of course, its race had such things. It added encouragingly that men would have them soon, of course, with heavy elements, even copper and iron, it would be easy. Then an overtone came into the thoughts that crowded into Tommy's brain from somewhere beyond the stars. Tommy did not notice the overtone at first. It was a feeling of eagerness and triumph and of a sneering superiority. 
Tommy got just a momentary impression of its thought of a space patrol subjugating all the galaxy to Earth. And the barest instantaneous flash of hatred because of that thought. But he was too much excited to notice. He was absorbed in his question about ray guns. It said that they were simple. In fact, it would tell him how to make one. And it began, simply, to explain. A bit of copper wire twisted just so, and a bit of carbon and a morsel of iron. It urged Tommy to make one immediately. It would guide his hands. The adjustment of the iron and carbon was delicate. Tommy was a small boy, and he sturdily controlled his own hands. In the end, the thing simply told him what to do. He made the contrivance, it suggested, putting the wire and iron and carbon together on a bit of board, having salvaged them from his father's supplies. The result did not look too impressive, to be sure. It did not even look like a ray pistol, and that may account for what ultimately happened. Because when it was finished, and... Tommy regarded it with a faint and illogical disappointment because it didn't look like Captain McGee's ray pistol. He suddenly felt the eager triumph in the thing which had instructed him. He glanced at the screen, and the thing was looking out of it with a ravening, unguarded hatred in its expression. To Tommy, it abruptly looked like the leader of those Mercurians who had wanted to wipe out the human race so they could emigrate to Earth. And suddenly he realized that it hated him and all of humanity with a terrible burning fury. Say, said Tommy Driscoll, his small boy's hands clenching and his brows contracting in the best possible imitation of Space Captain McGee. This don't look so good. His voice wobbled suddenly, and he swallowed. I'm going to ask my father about this. The thing argued. Plausibly, flatteringly. But Tommy felt corrosive hatred behind the ingratiating thoughts. Somehow, it reminded him of the dictator of Pluto in one of the comic books he had read only the day before. It asked almost sneeringly if he was afraid. Scared? No, said Tommy, in his clear trouble, but with the portentous grimness of McGee. I'm just cagey. I'll have my father look this over to see if it's what you say it is. Then the thing raged. Into Tommy's brain there came such menaces, such threats, that his mind reeled. There was authority there, too, and at ten years one is accustomed to obey authority. But there was a sudden deep suspicion in Tommy's mind, too, and he was fortified by all his knowledge of how the Star Rover and Captain McGee behaved when defying worm monsters and giraffe men and immaterial entities and other non-human races. As the thing raged at him, trying to overwhelm his will with iterated and reiterated commands and threats and sneers and mockery and derision and everything else which should have made Tommy try out his gadget, as the thing raged at him, Tommy fought sturdily, but under a strain which manifested itself as terror, and then panic, and then as hysterical defiance. Which, of course, was essential, if the comic books were ordained by fate and destiny to come true. Tommy was white and shaking and terrified when he got home. 
His family was at breakfast. He went into the dining room on leaden feet and with a whipped, scared look on his chalky white face. It was nine o'clock. Tommy had slipped away at sunrise. Now he returned, carrying a seemingly crude and seemingly purposeless object in his hand. It was made of copper wire with a bit of carbon and a morsel of iron. Where have you been? demanded his father sternly. He didn't call Tommy Captain, which meant that Tommy was in disgrace. Tommy looked at his father numbly. He shook all over. I said, where have you been? his father repeated. Your mother and I have been worried. Tommy swallowed. Then, suddenly, he went all to pieces. He burst into raging tears and flung the contrivance the thing had described into the midst of the breakfast table dishes. That old thing, he sobbed in hysterical fury. It was in the television screen, and it told me how to make this ray gun, and it, it told me to turn it on, and I was going to when I remembered that octopus scientist from Centauri who left a note for Captain McGee to make something and signed it Doc Blandy, and if he had made it, it would have blown up the whole earth. His father and mother stared. To have one's small son arrive at the breakfast table in a state of frenzy is upsetting. It is worse when he flings odd objects on the table and shatters a flower vase while sobbing of impossibilities. What, what's this? asked his father, at once startled and uneasy. What are you talking about, son? Tommy beat on the table with his fists. He blubbered, but he babbled with the starkly precise articulation of hysteria. His face was utterly white. He was beside himself. I tuned in the set in the laboratory he cried in little sobbing bursts of speech. I unscrambled it, and the thing looked at me. It was a thing that hated humans. It told me how to make this, and... and. Tommy's father went pale himself. He got up quickly, and his chair fell over backward. He tried to touch Tommy comfortingly, but Tommy thrust him away. Too many comic books, said Tommy's father, frightened. I'll get him to the doctor. I guessed what it wanted, panted Tommy, sobbing. And it knew what I was thinking, and it got mad. I knew it got mad. It laughed at me and asked me if I was a coward and scared to try the thing I'd made. And I said, you old Mercurian, you old Plutonian, you want to blow up Earth. And I went, bang! I, I sma smashed that t television screen, and I s s smashed. Then Tommy buried his head in his mother's lap and howled. And his father and mother looked at each other, white-faced, because they thought his mind had cracked. Even temporarily, it was awful to think about. But then... Professor Wardle, breakfasting with them, said very softly, Great heavens! He was looking at the contrivance Tommy had made under the thing's instruction. It wasn't quite like anything that anybody on earth had ever made before, but a scientist looking at it would see more than Tommy could have imagined. Professor Wardle saw aspects that made sense. Then he saw things that he could understand but could not possibly have devised. And then he saw the implications. L look, said Professor Wardle, dry-throated. It's true. L look what he made, what this thing would do. 
With shaking hands, he disconnected a wire, so it could not possibly be turned on by accident. Then he trembled. Tommy wept himself back to something like composure in his mother's arms. The antics of his father and Professor Wardle helped, of course. They babbled at each other over his contrivance. They looked incredulously at each other. Then they drew diagrams at each other, talking feverishly. Then Tommy's father remembered him. Captain, said Tommy's father, and there was sweat on his face. You did a good day's work, all right, but please don't do it again without warning me. This, this contrivance of yours isn't a ray pistol. It's a thing that will start a chain reaction in carbon and iron. If you had turned it on, all the carbon and iron within its range would have started to act like an atomic pile, and it would have spread, and we couldn't have stopped it. There wouldn't have been any more Earth. Tommy blinked at him, catching his breath from time to time as a small boy will do after desperate weeping. Then his eyes began to shine. Gee, said Tommy, that... That thing was trying to destroy Earth, wasn't he? And I stopped him. He was, said Tommy's father in a very queer voice indeed. And you did. If a grown-up had been in your place, the trick would have been different, and it probably would have worked. Tommy ceased to catch his breath. He glowed. I was like Captain McGee, he said breathlessly. Tommy's father swallowed. He needed to hold tightly to his self-control. He, like Professor Wardle, had all the sensations now of a man who had just realized that his life and that of his family and that of every other human being on earth had hung by a hair for seconds. But he saw, too, that the deadly small contrivance which had not annihilated humanity made use of, and so revealed, exactly the new principles Earth scientists needed most urgently to know. It would mean atomic engines and power and spaceships and ray guns. They would mean a space patrol to protect Earth against just such creatures as had been foiled by Tommy Driscoll. And that meant... Yes, said Tommy's father gently, just like Captain McGee, Tommy. It appears that the comic books are coming true. End of From Beyond the Stars by Murray Leinster Recording by Pneumatic Also known as Vincent V. Marshburn